Hey folks, we're ready to get started. Um, as we turn back to the next part of this um, um, meeting and the item, um, I'm, I'd like to address staff on a couple questions. So officially we've closed the public hearing. We've uh, addressed any um, responses that were um, made by public comment. And um, our next step in the process of this, I have a question for our uh, city clerk. Madam Clerk, if you received additional written protests, It's the fan, it's the fan, it's the belt on the fan. Okay. Middle WD-40 will help that. Um, okay. Thanks, Dana. So, um, formally, Madam Clerk, if you've received additional written protests during the public hearing, please include those protests in a tally and repo report them for the final tally at this point. The clerk's office has received 12 timely submitted protests since the last tally. That does not include the bundles that were delivered by Ms. Donnelly. So the number of protests received as of this time is 2,158. What was the final? 2,158. 58, okay. Again, that does not include the bundles that were okay. described as being submitted prior to. Okay, all right, so based on that, um, I, I think it's a question for council on um, proceeding with the submitted um, numbers that we've received and the ones that were submitted tonight that we um, have been informed were um, done so, Joe, in a way that was outside the process of the Prop 218. Yes, the, the ones that were submitted, other than the ones that the city clerk just described, the thousand or so, and I'm using the thousand because that's what we were told the number was. The thousand that were submitted, you were told, were submitted without one of the requirements that your procedure established. Based on that, I believe the council has authority to not include those tonight in the total count. The council also has authority to include them. If you don't include them, there is not, we have not received a 50% plus one, so you can go forward with the rate increase, the surcharge, approving that resolution that's on the agenda. Yes, yeah, resolution 7118. If you include the thousand that were submitted as part of the, the total rough count, then we need to take the next step, which is um, continue this meeting till the date certain, and the clerk will then need to go through the validation process for all 3,158. Okay. And I think, to be clear, what we have for rough count is 2,158. We've received a bundle to which we were told there's a thousand, and we have no way of, uh, unless we um, proceed with a rough count, we're taking that the submission of a thousand is about a thousand. We, we don't know if it's 900, we don't know if it's 700, or we don't know if it's 50. We were given a bundle, and we were told it's somewhere around a thousand. That's the, what I understood when we right. received those. Right, and to have a better rough count of that, the city clerk has indicated it'll probably take two hours to do that based on how she knows she just went through a whole process that was four hours for 2,000. Yeah. Okay. All right. So with that, um, it's, uh, we entered a discussion with council on how we'd want to proceed. And um, as our city attorney um, laid out what our options were, um, we could proceed with the rough count that was received per our um, resolution and within the guidelines and laws of the Prop 218 that we um, proceeded with, um, or we can make a decision to um, include the ones that were received. And, and I would say at this point, 
a number that's uncertain, I, I think would be fair. And, and the numbers that we have, the 2,158, uh, are technically um, unvalidated submissions. So we're, we have 2,158 unvalidated submission um, submitted protests. Um, with, with actually, actually, and you have five unvalidated withdrawals. So if the withdrawals are all validated, you only have 200, 2,153. Okay. So. Um, 2,158 took those into account. The 2,158 took those into account. So it's a total of 2,158 after the withdrawals. Thanks, Dana. Just for clarification, the five withdrawals had already been included in the count, so the total less the withdrawals is 2,158, 2,158. Okay, less the withdrawals. Okay, all right, good. Okay, um, up for discussion. Uh, Red, do you want to start us off on, on any discussion on this and what your position might be? Yes. I am inclined to not accept the votes submitted by Ms. Donnelly for several reasons. One, if, as Ms. Hawley said, those votes were cast before the Prop 218 hearing period was opened, then those votes were cast on an undefined issue that the voters did not have all of the information upon which to base their vote. Number two, I received two personal telephone calls from neighbors who complained that people did come to their house and tell them that if they did not vote no on the Prop 218, that their water rates would go up between $300 and $800 per month, and that their property values would be cut in half. The, um, I find that the timing of tonight's submission was designed to be disruptive, uh, throwing in a thousand votes at the last minute when they could, if they were collected back in April and May, they could easily have been turned into the clerk's office during the voting period prior to tonight and could have been counted at that time. And I believe that those who voted before the Prop 218 period was open were given ample notice that those votes did not count, would not count, and they had ample opportunity to resubmit their votes during the process, and I must assume that they did that. So for those reasons, I am not in favor of accepting those last minute, undated, unvalidated votes. I'd also like to add um, a, uh, agreements with Red in terms of um, the 2,000 plus 2,100 votes that we have received as Dana replies. And then these, I do believe given the requirements in the last month and a half of how these votes being due and the warranty and the public, um, publicizing of these votes coming in, I think it's those votes I can understand getting them and accepting them and wanting to go over them. These votes that are just handing in at the last moment <clears throat> without the date, I give it given that this vote's been open for well over six weeks, there's been plenty of time to, re um, to resubmit those votes. Um, so I am in agreement with Red that I am not in agreement of accepting those last minute votes because I do believe there's been um, an, plenty of enough time to hand in votes. Thank you. Matt, um, thanks. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as Fred Rogers would say, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, you should. Um, it's not really a beautiful day in the neighborhood because no matter what decision we make tonight, um, there's still going to be a fractured community. Um, there are many people that aren't here that I have spoken to that want this initiative to move forward. Many of you have spoken to me that do not want it to move forward. But I'm elected to make a decision, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, 
I was swayed significantly by a statement that I wrote down verbatim for Miss Brinkman. And, and it said this, she said this, people must have all of the information needed to make a decision. I agree. The thousand, um, if there are a thousand additional um, quote unquote ballots that were submitted, um, it's apparent to me that they were um, submitted with incomplete information and inadequate information. As a result, no solid good decision could be made based upon that, in my opinion. The city has gone out of its way to be transparent, to define a process that is best practiced by the League of Cities. Um, staff has gone out of their way to make themselves available significantly to the community and numerous venues trying to reach out. There are a significant number of people that just don't seem to come to things to get information, and I understand that. I agree with my um, colleagues. Um, I believe we should move forward, um, not count the additional ballots, and uh, close the hearing um, with the count uh, that exists uh, at present. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Marlis? Sure. Uh, I, I really want to say thank you to the staff. Um, I know how hard it's been, and I know how long it's been, and I know how much work they've put in to designing a process that is fair and reasonable and that went well beyond the requirements of a 218. Um, and I really want to say thank you to the staff. Uh, and I think they have made themselves available. They've tried everything within their power to help the citizens with this decision. Um, I agree with my colleagues. We should not accept the 1,000. Uh, ballots, uh, but I would like to get an accurate count. I would like the validation process to go forward because I'm convinced that in the 2,158 ballots, we have a lot of invalid ones. And I'm guessing that if we even went through the 1,000, we'd find that we have far less than that. And I do think that we owe the public a fair accounting of how the vote went. I, I, and I think Joan Solu said that. We do need to know how the community voted. And so that's my additional recommendation. But otherwise, I, I accept not including the 1,000. OK, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I know it's been a long, emotional um, process and how we're going through this. Um, I want to thank staff, uh, Dana and everybody at the front counter, Lori, um, everybody um, has been working really, really hard at this. And um, Scott, Rob, I, it just goes on. You guys have just done an amazing job in working through this. Um, and I think that actually the community should be proud of that. Um, it, it is a, it is a difficult public process uh, and we've gone through it other cities have gone through it the state constitution has enacted the prop 218 process in which um, we've operated under um, I would agree with the, my colleagues on uh, council that um, we need to proceed and um, Marlis I would support that the um, recommendation to validate the votes um, I think it's important to do that as well I'm um, sensitive to the amount of work and, and, and everything that Lori and Dana and, and staff and everybody's done on that. Um, I, I think it's something that we, we own to do that. Um, but uh, you know, I, would, uh, I would support my colleagues and, um, and move ahead on this. So, Red? May I make a motion? Absolutely. I move that the uh, that we adopt both water and sewer wastewater surcharges through the adoption of resolution number 71-18 for the proposed water reclamation facility. Second. Motion by Mr. Davis, second by Mr. Heading. Any further discussion? None. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? None. Motion carries 5-0. There wasn't a roll call vote necessary for that? No, okay, good. Um, so can we follow up on uh, some of the, the uh, discussion on
counting and validating the, the votes from here? Um, yeah, can we have a discussion with, with staff on, on what that would what would that would be like? Um, I, Lori, I, I already know it's, it's going to be a little bit, but um, if we just kind of get some, some guidance on what that would look like. Um, Scott, maybe you can help us out, or Dana. We anticipate um, at least two staff members, three full days to conduct the validation. Um, I would suggest or request that um, since it is not a necessary process to move forward, that perhaps it would be concluded in two weeks um, so that we have a little latitude to work around other competing priorities and schedules in order to get that done. We do intend to have um, staff from other agencies come in and assist with that process so that um, it's being overseen by someone who's not personally involved in it. So, um, we'd we'd bring in additional staff from outside an outside agency to help us with that about three days. But we would look for coordinating that with them, and we would expect about two weeks to be able to f finalize that. So, would that mean that uh, those we would have that back prior to the, our next council meeting? Yes. Scott. Yes, yeah, sir. Joe whispered in my ear. We, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. We would complete the count by the end of September, and it would be announced prior to the October 9th council meeting. Okay. I don't anticipate we could have the number by September 25th. What, what she said was we need a couple weeks to complete that process in order to balance that with other priorities. With that being the case, we, we need a week to put the staff report together, so it would be the October 9th council meeting. And, and if we have that information ahead of time, we'll put that out in a press release so that so everybody knows um, that goes to council. There's no action that would need to be taken. I think it's just an informational item. One question that does come up, we, we intended to do the validation process in public. If uh, the question of whether or not the rate was going to proceed or not was still in play, um, that's still an op we still an option to do even though you've approved the rates. Um, that we could have a, a public component of to observe the validation process, and that just trying to gauge council's opinion on that. Yeah. Uh, any comment? John, go ahead. Yeah. It, 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 just a comment. Um, uh, given the fact that you know my comment about transparency in the process and best pra using best practice from the League of Cities, um, I have full faith and confidence in our staff that they will also be transparent and do that. And the validation does nothing more than give um, a better sense of what the actual number was, but will have no impact on this hearing and the finality of the vote that was just taken. Therefore, I don't see that necessary. Any further comments on that? Red? It bothers me to use significant staff time for this because the issue is decided. Appreciate that. Matt? Marlis? Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with our staff doing it, especially since there would be other staff involved that would be overseeing it. So I have every confidence in our staff's ability to do that and to do it fairly. So I, 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 I wouldn't think it needed to be a public process. But I would like it to proceed. I would like to know how many valid protests we received. And I realize it takes time, but we've taken a lot of time, and I think the community needs to know how many valid protests there were. It should be noted that, that those become public record, so folks could seek to, uh, was it to actually look at them uh, in, their, in their entirety so okay. that they can see it, what that looked like after the fact. Okay, yeah. I just think we owe it to the citizens. Okay. Um, Red, I appreciate um, the and the value of our staff time as well. Um, it's just one of those. I think uh, we need to have some other finality to it, and I, I would support the validating. Forgive me, Lori. 
but I, I do think uh, I do think it uh, is necessary and Dana um, so at this point uh, I think we've got support for that and, and so we've got yeah can support. I make a motion then that we do validate the yeah. ballots that we've received sure and I second so we have a motion by uh, Ms. McPherson to validate the ballots received. Yeah. All, all 3,158? No. No, just the ones that we received on time. Could you specify the number, please? The 2,158 ballots that were received according to the process. And if we're going to validate those, it would also suggest that we validate the withdrawals okay. of protests to make yeah. sure that those met the okay. same requirements. Yes, please. All right. Okay. 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 I can't help myself. I'm going to be a six yeah. counts person. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> if, if, if the goal that you're trying to reach is um, transparency and making sure the public is heard, I'm confused as to why you wouldn't include the thousand. I, I, Sorry, Dana. I, I, I actually, Joe, I, I agree. Um, I, I, I do agree. I, I with agree that. too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we're going to validate that, we, right? Let's we, let's we get an accurate do you out want, of everything. Does Does but Council he, want to understand what the validation process will look like and what we're actually looking at? Is that something you're interested in hearing right now? Yes, I think yeah. you should describe okay. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we be we be looking at all the requirements in the resolution, the, the very requirements that were included in the sample ballot. So staff would check each one to see if, if there's anything missing that would be put in the invalid box. If all of the necessary components are there, they'd check that against the APN or address or customer of record. And if it's determined that individual is eligible, that would, in essence, count as a valid protest. And there would be another place to file those away, right? And you would just continue on until you're done. Um, there will be some that fall in the gray area, um, but I think most of them would be pretty obvious. Um, the ones that are in the gray area would probably require some conference with the third party that's going to be observing the process as we go along. So that that's kind of the, the basics, and then you would have the, the validated numbers and the invalidated numbers, and the those that were submitted this evening, the thousand um, if that number is accurate, that, that those thousand, would, if the data isn't on them like they said they are, those would kind of wouldn't meet the validation process. But we would be looking at other components of that as well. That if there were other reasons why they weren't validated, or if there was duplications, if for instance somebody submitted it then to Cal, but they also submitted one later on after the 218 process had been initiated. In we essence, would, those are duplications, and we'd be able to kind of flog those. Yeah, I think it would be important to know all of the types of, of invalid uh, ballots, actually. Then, then let me ask another question maybe you were going to ask. So once we have that set of everyone, everything that, that had the six checks on it, there was going to be another analysis, whether or not it's valid, the word valid or not, I don't know, from my perspective, it would be valid validating it. If it's a duplicate, remember, only one vote per parcel counts. Right. So if that group that we just said has all the six check marks on it, do you want staff to review and see if there's any duplicates in there? Correct. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll be coming back to you with the number of the net number. parcels that received a valid vote. Correct. Because that's the way the vote is determined, 50% plus one. So that's what we would like to know. So in terms of process, um, what we will do is first validate the 2,158 protests and withdrawals and have that final worksheet. After that, we will go through the thousand that were not counted for purposes of this resolution to determine whether they're valid or whether they're duplicates so that that's known um, as a matter of information. Correct. Still 
Yeah, no, Matt seconded. Yeah, motion, uh, motion, Sorry. yeah, motion to um, validate the count by Marlis, a second by Matt. And the discussion was, or the question was, all 3,000, which to be clear, we only have a count of 2,158 and we received a, uh, an envelope of uh, protests. We have no idea what those are but we have been informed that they were received and taken prior to the Prop 218 process, which we've, we've determined to be all invalid, right? So, so my question is, if they're already declared invalid, why are we trying to validate the invalidity? Uh, I, that, that's, I'm sorry, I just, yeah. I mean, to that, me, it, I, a, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of staff's time. I know the resources are stretched. Um, to what end does that help repair the community or what? Because they're already invalidated. And, and that's, that's a question for council to ask. Uh, answer I'm asking yourselves. my colleagues. A, an, yeah, answer yourselves. But um, I think you, you answered the question just in terms of people wanting to know. Um, we believe that the majority of them probably submitted after the 218 was initiated. So most likely there's duplications and I think people want to know that. But the process has been determined to have been completed and you have invalidated them. So it's a kind of a post-mortem analysis, if you will. That's basically what's... Necroscopy, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Red? I have to say again, we have a very full schedule for the rest of this year. We have already added a council meeting that was unforeseen, which is going to add significant staff time. I don't want to use our valuable resources on an issue that is already settled. I agree again. Okay. So we have a motion by Marlos, a second uh, by Matt to validate the count. And to be clear, the motion was to include all, all of them received the 2,158 and the bundle that was received under the pretense that they were received by Cal prior to our 218 process. That's that's what the motion is. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. No. I've been a, I, I'm going to be a, a yes when I when I did for Marlis. So we've got a three two for. Um, to, for an, a fail on that. So we're not going to validate them. That's what I understood. So we have a no from Red, a no from Matt, a no from John, a yes from Marlis, and a yes from, from me. So it fails with a 3-2. So we're not going to so we're not going to do any validating, period. That's what I just received from, from council. Okay. Unless there's any other motions or discussions for tonight, we're, we've just determined that we're not going to do any validations on the 2158 that were received or anything else. Okay. All right. Um, unless there's any other motions or discussions, we'll close item B1 and move on to the next item. Seeing none, we'll move on to item C1. Item C1 is Community Choice Energy Status Report and provide direction on key Community Choice Energy um, issues. We're setting this one up.
Thanks, Lori. Okay. All right. Um, so we're moving on to item uh, for community choice energy, give it an update and also kind of go into more detail. Uh, the city council will recall um, earlier this year in February, um, we reaffirmed as an entire council unanimously affirmed that pursuit of a community choice energy program was an objective for this calendar year. Um, since that time, uh, we were notified by the city of Slow through a letter from the mayor on behalf of the entire city council that they were seeking partners in the Slow County region to pursue a regional community choice energy, understanding that with economies of scale, you, you gain greater leverage uh, on the revenues that can be received through um, a community choice energy program to apply those funds either to pay down energy rates and or um, create local jobs through energy local energy projects. Um, since that time, uh, staff has been working, well, that, that item was brought to, to city council to see if there was interest um, to pursue uh, this with the city of Sloan and any of the other partners in the community who might be interested, other cities that is, um, including the county. Uh, at that time, we were the only one that, that showed interest, and so we worked um, with the city of SLO in, in partnership to kind of proceed kind of in haste really to um, work with a consultant and um, develop a RFP to look into uh, procuring services to help find a, a firm that can help us get over the finish line to, to look at implementation uh, next year or the year after to move forward. Uh, but council is very, very, um, Astute in, in asking a lot of good questions about financial vi viability of this this program, uh, if it makes sense for our community, we're too small. Um, are there too many other things going on with staff? A lot of really good questions, and so um, we we promised you to keep updates uh, as we move forward in the process, and ultimately come back uh, before there's a go no go decision to provide more up to date information, not only about the viability of the program, but changing regulations and to see if there are other uh, partners in the, the SLO County who wanted to join forces with us in SLO. Uh, and SLO at the same time working with their city council to, to provide those same important updates. So um, the intent of this evening is to provide um, kind of a little bit of re-education because it's been a while since we've really discussed this at length, uh, the Community Choice Energy, what that is all about, the programs. Um, present the, uh, at a high level, the, the city's approach, as well as City of Slow's approach to Community Choice Energy Program, the technical study that is very technical. Um, I know that all of you read them, every last detail, and asked really good questions, but there is a lot in the, entailed in that. There's also an implement, implementing ordinance for a Community Choice Energy Program. That is a draft that's provided, and there's plenty of opportunity for discussion on that tonight. <coughs> and a lot of interest as well as a, a joint execution of powers or JPA resolution um, since we would be creating another body um, of which we would be representatives, um, you know, council members and, and city managers, same with City of Slow. Um, there's a lot of important questions to ask for that. So we hope to tee up a good discussion for you tonight. Um, and ultimately, if there is continued interest that we would bring back all these things, not in draft form, but in actual form for deliberation on September 25th. So we we'll just go through the history and background of the Community Choice Energy. I will turn it over to um, the City of Slow's sustainability um, team to provide more information about that. Um, they're, they're truly experts in this area and have done a lot of great work um, to, to provide kind of more of the technical side. And then we can go into the ordinance and JPA agreement and ultimately the financing which is a very important question in next steps. So from, a, from the, the high level, um, prior to CCs coming into existence, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, consumer choice as it relates to uh, electricity uh, procurement. Um, you were either with PG&E or San Diego Gas and Electric or wherever you were located with very few exceptions. There are some 
municipalities that ran their own utilities, but for the most part, um, the corporations who are providing you with your power, um, and you have very little say as to um, the, the green level, the, the, the costs, um, you know, the profits going to the shareholders and not coming back to the ratepayers. Um, and that dynamic was significantly changed when uh, community choice energies were allowed to, to come into the fold. And um, ultimately what it does is it allows local governments to pool the electricity demand of, of their communities, their ratepayers in that community, to purchase and sell power to meet that demand. Um, so what this does is it creates a competitive market where consumers actually have choice, whereas before they had no choice. There currently are uh, folks who live in Morro Bay don't have a choice who provides their electricity or where they purchase it from. Um, and often uh, community choice energy programs have found that they not only can provide a cleaner and greener energy source, they actually can compete or even be lower priced than PG&E or the equivalents in the areas in which they've started the program. Um, we keep the revenues. Instead of it going to shareholders, it comes back to the, the JPA or if it's a single community that's launched, it comes back to that, to that governing body to make decisions about how to allocate those revenues either to pay down the rates or to invest in uh, clean energy programs or clean energy projects in their own communities where you don't have any say in that matter if it's PG&E or their equivalent. Um, so what that does is bring local control, uh, freedom of choice, which doesn't currently exist, and competition, which doesn't currently exist locally. So how it works is the um, community choice energy team or whoever kind of the board, but also the, the staff that works for them uh, is, is tasked with buying energy. Um, utility continues on as is. Uh, you're still gonna, we're still gonna work with PG&E. Uh, your bill will, will look essentially the same as uh, in the future as it does today, except that you will have um, more opportunity for choice that you currently don't have. Um, so in essence, the big change is the front end in terms of purchasing and then also the decisions about how to allocate revenues, uh, revenues that exceed uh, expenses, how to reinvest those. Um, those decisions would be up to the JPA or if it's one entity, that, that entity to make those decisions. Uh, currently there are a multitude of community choice energy programs. Those in green are those that have already launched. Um, so. A lot of grouping around the, the coast, which shouldn't be surprising, but there are a lot of communities, those in gray or inland communities, and um, they're conservative, I'll, I'll mention, that are also looking at this because they can offer competitive rates to their uh, community members in addition to the, the greening and cleaning of the energy sources. So a vast majority of the state population are in, either are already involved in one of these or are under consideration for a community choice energy program, including the city of Morro Bay and, and uh, city of Slow. So again, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, uh, 2013, there was a presentation of the city council from Slow Clean Energy, um, extolling the virtues of this. It was very new at that time. A lot of excitement and interest. Um, but as council knows, uh, there, there's a lot going on at that time or in recession, just learning that we were losing the um, uh, Dynergy or Duke Energy was, was decommissioning. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of work going into just kind of keeping the city solvent, um, that there wasn't an opportunity to really push this. In addition, there was a lot of other studies that needed it to occur before um, we really had concrete information about the viability of such a program, but a lot of interest across the county on that. But the council did ad adopt a resolution number uh, 4713 that you know, said that the city should pursue it with, with vigor and interest um, and do the necessary studies to determine the viability of, of a program here. Um, in 2015, the city did its first strategic goal setting or strategic framework setting to, to kind of align um, community interest, council interest with budgetary and staff resources to really kind of hone uh, the city. And um, that was further validated in February of this year when council did kind of reevaluation of all their goals and objectives. And CCE was, was one of about 30 total citywide that were identified as, as something that council felt was important to pursue. And as I mentioned, 
that was around the same time the city of slow was also looking forward to move moving into more out of the evaluation into actual pursuit of of a program and so we joined forces in may and have been doing a lot of work since then um, so since that time in may we've been working um, I would say Chris Reed and I probably talk at least once or twice a week um, about this since since May. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of work, far more than I have, and uh, we owe them a lot for, for that. They have at least two staff members and consultants that are working on this, at, and they're not charging us a cent for that. Um, so we're, we're very gracious for all, for all their hard work um, and, and collaboration and willingness to, to consider us a partner, an equal partner at that. So, um, We've been working uh, diligently towards getting, doing RFP and selecting a vendor who can carry us forward at no cost up front to do the heavy lifting on the technical studies, the viability, implementation plan, um, all the way to getting the thing up and running. So um, the deferred compensation model allows us to, to move forward without a cost at this time. Um, and ultimately working on a JPA that um, insulates the city from financial risk once the thing is up and running and, and proven viable. Um, and we can go into more detail about how that all works. Um, and we, we really did do, I should say, City of Slow did outreach to other communities in our, our area to see if there was interest, and there is a lot of interest. It's just, as, as the case with Morro Bay and the case with every city, there's a lot of other things going on at once. Um, and they weren't necessarily positioned, but there's still a lot of interest. Um, so we, we, we think there is value in pursuing um, a partnership because you get the economies of scale that otherwise wouldn't exist as a single entity. Um, and you're promoting future collaboration because if one joins, there's a likelihood that others will join in the future. Um, from the timing considerations that we we're dealing with right now, um, the Public Utility Commission passed a rule earlier this year uh, that really kind of put us on a, a path of, of trying to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, though with with understanding that we had to kind of dot our I's and cross our T's to make sure this thing would, would work out in the end. Um, in the past, you could submit something to the Public Utilities Commission and be able to start up shortly thereafter. Um, but there's been heavy heavy lobbying of the PUC by, by the utility companies to kind of try to curry favor and, and pull things more to benefit them, uh, understanding that they do lose customers through this process. There's stranded costs. There's um, sunk costs that they feel they need to be um, compensated for in some way. So there's a slowdown, if you will, um, in being able to implement these programs. So basically, how this what this means is if we, if council decides to move forward this year, we would work with Haste to submit an implementation plan before the end of the year. Uh, to the Public Utilities Commission, they would accept that, and then we'd have to wait an entire year before we could actually begin um, operations. And that was a change that was made this year, and that's why we feel it's important if all the ducks are in a row, if it makes sense to Council from a financial feasibility standpoint to move forward that we do it this year, because if we wait, we'll have to wait till 2021 to, to launch, which is more than two years from now. Uh, as far as completed tasks, um, a lot of this, again, is, is a testament to the, the, the firepower over at the City of Slow, but yeah, we've got a, a project plan and draft implementation plan budget, um, the technical study, which was included in the, um, attached to the agenda packet, um, the draft implementing ordinance, draft JPA agreement, resolution for the Central Coast Inter Community Energy Program, um, they've put out a, a web page, uh, which includes our information on that as well. Um, they've met with stakeholders both in SLO as well as Morro Bay, and we presented a brief update to Morro Bay City Council in August, I think August 14th. So with that, I think I will turn it over to uh, Chris Reed with the City of SLO to talk a bit about the technical study. Good evening, Mayor, uh, City Council. Thank you for having us here tonight. 
My name is Chris Reed. I'm the Sustainability Manager at the City of San Luis Obispo, and I'm joined by Bob Hill, who is the uh, Interim Deputy Director of the Office of Sustainability at the City of San Luis Obispo. Um, before we jump into the specifics around the draft technical study, I do want to note and, and acknowledge that this is a highly technical topic. Um, we'll present information at a, a level enough to sort of understand high-level takeaways, and we'll certainly be um, able and willing to answer any more detailed questions um, after the presentation. I also just want to note, prior to, to getting into the details here, that uh, at the city and in, in partnership with the city of Morro Bay, we've assembled a really uh, excellent team of experts to help support us through this, given the technical nature and the nuances of starting a program of this type. So through a variety of, of competitive bidding processes and other procurement mechanisms, uh, we have a team supporting us that includes Sean Marshall from Lean Energy, who's also visiting us tonight. Um, when, uh, if there's questions later around JPA um, or any of the organizational documents, um, she'll be able to help answer those. Sean's been uh, vital in forming a number of the CCA's uh, programs throughout the state and was actually a mayor um, in Marin County when Marin Clean Energy launched. So she has a deep history in this space and she's been a very helpful advisor. Uh, we also have retained uh, several uh, outside counsels, including Greg Stepinicic from Richard Watson's Gershon, who's the general counsel to um, Silicon Valley Clean Power and special counsel to Marin Clean Energy, as well as Steve Hall, who's an energy contract specialist uh, attorney. Uh, and then finally, uh, for this technical study, we've retained the energy authority. So we'll go into that now. So the draft technical study, as I just mentioned, was prepared by the Energy Authority, or TEA. The Energy Authority is a nonprofit that serves municipal utility providers throughout the country. The, and, and as noted, in this, and I believe in the staff report, the, we went through a, a, a really robust uh, procurement process to select this, this vendor. So we'd be happy to answer any questions on that as well. Um, as well as the contractual relationship between that vendor and the city and the eventual JPA should we move that direction. So in the technical study, um, there's a couple of, of important front end uh, information or details to discuss. So first, there's multiple participation and power supply scenarios. So we look at three participation, uh, excuse me, participation scenarios. One where the city of San Luis Obispo has its own program. Uh, a second, where there is a program with the city of Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo together uh, through a joint powers agreement. And then finally, one where other regional partners join. So for the sake of this presentation, we'll focus exclusively on the San Luis Obispo and or mostly on the San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay version because that's the, the approach we're currently uh, tr trending on. There are also a number of power supply scenarios presented. It's important to note the difference between renewable and greenhouse gas free. Renewable is a legal definition uh, under state law and public utility commission regulation. It means very narrowly, narrowly um, solar, wind, um, and small hydro as well as a couple other small resources. But then there are greenhouse gas free uh, generators like nuclear and large hydro, which we can count as GHG free but just don't count under state law as renewable. So it's kind of a... Uh, esoteric detail, but, but one that, that matters a little bit um, in, in the next slide. Uh, across all of these participation scenarios and supply scenarios, we have uh, just standard baseline assumptions. And all of these are to ensure that the findings of our technical study are, are conservative in nature. So first, we just assume in our financial pro forma that there's a 3% rate savings relative to PG&E across all rate classes. We assume that the portfolio of power we're purchasing is 100% uh, greenhouse gas or carbon free. And we also assume that about 10% of all customers will choose to not participate in the program and will stay with PG&E. Um, this isn't prescriptive. All of those things could vary uh, under the direction of the board of directors or under direction of program performance, but we feel it's a good conservative base to start. So here's the, the real meat of the study. That this is the, the findings under the different um, procurement scenarios. And so just to, just to describe how to interpret uh, this table real quick, you see across the top scenario one, two, and three, those are different levels of... Excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, could you maybe refer in our packet where that is because we can't really see the slide, all of us? Yeah, sure. That would be helpful each time if you change slides. 
Yeah. Ask Mr. Collins to help with that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> We've got. <clears throat> so this would be page uh, 174 of 245 on the agenda packet. So the three columns are, are these are all examples of if it's more. In the, uh, it's in the staff report, not the technical report. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is assuming the participation scenario of San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay, and then there's the three uh, procurement scenarios. So the first one being we just comply with minimum state law. We have about 33% renewable and the remainder greenhouse gas free uh, in 2020, increasing to 50% by 2030. In the second scenario, it's 50% renewable with the remainder GHG free. And then in scenario three, it's 75% renewable. Now again, these aren't our only three options. They're merely to provide um, uh, examples of, of what our revenues might look like under different scenarios. So we see with 3% uh, rate savings accounted in, with 10% opt out, at the end of year three, so this is after we've paid off our initial uh, startup capital loans, uh, paid off some of our upfront bonding requirements, et cetera, um, we, under scenario one, under current market conditions, we would have cash on hand about $12.3 million um, under just scenario one, all the way down to around uh, $9.7 million in scenario three. Now this last row is, is especially uh, confusing and complicated, so I apologize. But essentially what that's reporting is what percentage of an annual operating cost is that cash on hand. So after year three, we would have about 70% of our annual operating cost as, as cash in hand. And that's important for a number of reasons. First, it, it illustrates our ability to build uh, reserves. Uh, and second, those are around the percentages that we need if we want to go out and get a credit rating, which would then allow us to have access to um, credit for building projects and, and doing other more capital intensive uh, items eventually. So those numbers look, look really good for a program our size, um, and that's all under expected uh, base, uh, base case market and regulatory conditions. But obviously we know that um, each there's a number of variables that those numbers may be sensitive to. So we ran a, our TEA ran a sensitivity analysis, and in particular identified a stress test case where if three sort of things that those numbers are sensitive to all were to occur at one time, that they would uh, be, be challenging for the program. So the first is um, there's this exit fee that all CCE program customers have to pay to make remaining PG&E customers essentially whole. And I can, we can talk a whole lot more about that. But the short of it is that that fee, whether it's, it's high or low, affects our ability to, uh, to be rate competitive. So the, the stress test case here is that if that fee is to increase significantly, if energy prices are much more expensive than they currently are, they're currently expected to be, and PG&E's generation rates decrease significantly, then under that scenario, it shows a negative cash flow for the slow Morro Bay participation scenarios. But in the larger participation scenarios, it, there are actually positive cash flows. So this illustrates the importance that if we want to move forward um, that having intentional uh, outreach and, and ensuring that we grow intentionally with our regional partners is really important for, for financial security um, and one we think is, is a viable uh, approach. And in fact, when we talk about the, the Joint Powers Agreement, you'll see we've uh, structured it to, uh, to allow that to occur. So the key findings of the technical study, again, are under base case market and regulatory conditions. All three supply scenarios will be feasible while offering customers a rate discount relative to PG&E. The stress test case demonstrates that the program could be sensitive to market changes and regulatory conditions, and that the power charge and difference adjustment, again, that exit fee that we talked about, is a really key risk factor. And it's important to know here that the California Public Utilities Commission will be issuing a decision on the PCIA that will affect whether that goes up or down. Um, uh, expected on the 13th, and it sounds like if it doesn't occur on the 13th, it will very likely occur on the 27th. So um, in some ways, that's not ideal timing for us for obvious reasons, but we have discussed with, our, um, with all of our uh, technical vendors that we essentially, um, we can move forward if it's, if it's both of our councils, uh, you know, wishes to do so uh, and essentially not incur cost until the PCI decision, PCIA decision has been settled. And, and the other actions that we'd be taking, which is an implementing ordinance and creating the JPA, could both also be unwound without any cost. 
So that's a technical study. Do you want to take yeah. over the? Um, so the the implementing ordinance um, really kind of sets us on a path to to proceed forward and takes care of all the the, the nitty gritty, <laughs> if you will. It's actually an un, uncodified ordinance, so it wouldn't be in our municipal code, but it's the requirement uh, of the state that we have an ordinance that establishes the city as a CCE program implementer. Um, that's kind of the main point um, that I want to make there, but we're happy to answer any questions uh, about it or field those after this meeting uh, in, in anticipation of the uh, September 25th city council meeting. Um, we did spend a lot of time on that, but uh, as staff, but just one thing to know, I mean, those are, those are pretty cookie cutter. Um, I, having worked on the Monterey Bay Community Power Program, uh, myself as a staffer for the city of Santa Cruz, it, it is pretty standard language. Um, it's really kind of the, the JPA also follows that in line, but there are some kind of key decision points that staff worked on and I worked on with the, the city attorney and the city attorney from um, city of Slow and city manager as well and, and consultants to, to really make sure we at least have the major components together and that city council has plenty of opportunity to review them and see if there's any issues um, with that. So. Um, the JPA agreement, um, again, is adapted from several of the existing and successful community choice energy programs. Um, the agreement has been reviewed by, again, by, by all, all the staff members on the city of SLO and, and myself that I mentioned earlier. Um, it does require an adopting resolution from each city um, for us to proceed forward into a JPA agreement itself. That could be done at, during the first reading of the ordinance or on the, the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, that's really uh, council's decision. Um, we did come up with a name for the agency. It's the, at least as staff is proposing, it's the Central Coast Community Energy Program. And the reason why we're not calling it slow or moral bay or some kind of amalgamation of the two is that you know there's anticipation that other cities and potentially the county, if slow, would join forces. We know um, the Paso Robles was very, very interested. So as as was Grover Beach this year, they just didn't have time to put it, put it all together with other things that they were trying to accomplish. Um, the major elements are, are outlined on this slide. Um, they probably look a lot like other JPA agreements um, that the city's been uh, party to, but. You, you announce kind of the purpose and recitals of, of the JPA, and that's where kind of a lot of your your vision, mission, um, kind of the aspirational components of the program are identified. And then you have some more of the, um, I guess, more nitty gritty. It's the, the governance, internal organization. There are important decision points there in terms of, is it, an operations board as well as uh, a policy board that also has an operations board. Um, do elected officials preside only? No, or do you want city managers to be involved in kind of the operations and administration and have council members sit on the policy board to make higher level decisions? And those are all very important questions to answer. Um, th there's also uh, implement Article 4 is implementation action and documents that, that allow us to proceed. Article 5 is the financial provisions, which we can discuss at more length. Um, Article 6 is the withdrawal and termination clauses that, again, are pretty common for JPAs and then miscellaneous provisions. And also uh, important to know in Article 3 that the governance is how decisions are made. Very important because um, as it's kind of outlined, we would have two representatives from the city of Morro Bay and two representatives from the city of SLO. Obviously, the city of SLO has more um, rate payers, um, but really the goal, uh, at least what, what I experienced working for the Monterey Bay Community Power Program and, the, and working with Sean, and she helped us develop that program and her experience with others, is that you really do work towards unanimous decisions. I mean, these are extremely critical um, decisions about, you know, a year to two to three year commitments on, on energy um, purchasing that you really do want to work towards consensus. and. There are very few cases that um, she was able to identify where there, that wasn't achieved, um, even with turnover with city council members and board members, that um, they really strive to get 
get those unanimous decisions on the things that mattered most. Um, so kind of in more detail that the formation of the, the program um, includes kind of the debts and liabilities, obligations to the CCE, um, that they don't fall upon the municipalities that are involved. Uh, talks about membership and how new new cities could or cities want to join, how that process is conducted. Um, Article three again, governance and internal organization. This is the board of directors composition. As I mentioned, there would there be two directors from the city council and two directors from the city of Slow, um, and then there would be a focus of those that are on the policy decisions, the, the big high level things like purchasing, um, how we want to invest uh, addition, revenues that exceed expenditures and those kind of things. And then the operations board is really you know, the city managers and, and other um, designees that focus on the operation and administration of the program because there would be a staff that actually runs this program, um, most likely a, uh, a team that's, you know, contracted employees uh, it makes the most sense but those decisions will be made later by uh, by the the board of directors but ultimately the operations board is focused on the day-to-day -day operations and policy is high level and then um, there's provisions to allow for commissions uh, boards and, and uh, citizen committees as well it doesn't specify what those are it just provides the um, authority to create those and we found that that's been that's worked really well it's, it's sometimes you, you think you have an idea of what you want and then it's preordained in the JPA and you have to revise the JPA through the City Council's to make changes and instead it maybe makes more sense to not prescript what it's going to look like but provide the authority to create those those bodies that as you evolve over time it makes more sense to, to create those and not prescribe it in the beginning before you know what you really need um, so those are kind of the high-level points for the, the ordinance and JPA. Um, and we move on to uh, project financing timeline next steps, unless um, right now might be a good time to pause and see if there's questions on anything that came up to this point for tonight's proceeding, or I can move forward and we can get to the questions then. Any questions at this point? Keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Very good. Away we go. Okay, a very, very, very critical point here. Um, so we did mention the deferred compensation. That's not a bullet point here, so I do want to bring that up. We, um, the firm that we selected through a rigorous um, competitive process to, to, to do the feasibility studies, the implementation plan to get us up and running, um, we approximate those costs to be about $250,000 um, in deferred compensation. Um, Again, those would be paid back as we receive revenues once the program gets started. However, if we didn't get to the point where we actually started and we get past the, the PCIA ruling, um, there could be some uh, liability for the city. Uh, as I've discussed with um, the city of Slow, you know, I, I think if the city had skin in the game, that makes sense, but maybe not at a 50-50, maybe more of a 20-80 split that we would maybe assume some of those uh, some of those liabilities that the likelihood of a failure launch is, is very low I'm not sure if there's been any instance where um, they got to that point and didn't succeed in moving forward um, that's not to say that it, it couldn't happen um, and the bigger dollar amount is the, the one million dollars and what that represents is the upfront investment to actually start the program you need to hire an executive director you need to hire staff who are going to be the ones on the ground who are doing the research um, for for the the boards to decide where to procure their energy for how long making helping you make those very important decisions you want highly qualified experienced staff to do that and that requires money and that requires basically a loan of an upfront investment of about a million dollars before you actually start receiving the revenues and you'd pay that back over time uh, this is how it was done in the Monterey Bay Community Power uh, Program. It's been done in other places as well. Um, so that is something that the city of Slow and Morro Bay would share in the, um, basically in the credit, if you will, for that. Because if, if you get 
to a point where you've launched and, you, and it doesn't go anywhere um, and you've incurred staff time costs, I mean, you have, you have to be able to pay that somehow. So the city, in essence, would be in a position where we would work with the city of Slow and get bank financing for that front cost. And if, if it wasn't able to get anywhere, um, depending upon how much money was spent, we would, we would be, in essence, be um, liable for those expenses at a 20-80% split. Um, that is, the, the likelihood of that occurring is very minimal. It hasn't occurred with anyone as far as we know. Um, but just wanted to put that out there. And they can, they can help explain and answer the questions better than I can. But I just wanted to make sure that was understood um, in the, the highly unlikely scenario where we would get that far, actually ramp up, staff up, and then not go anywhere, not, not bring in revenues is, is very unlikely. But it's something we have to do. We have to if we want to proceed. Um, the project schedule, uh, the city of Slow had their study session on September 4th. We're having, I guess, we, well, not a study session, but a, a council agenda item to discuss it ahead of making decisions. Uh, September 18th, the city of Slow is in a, a go, no go decision as it relates to the JPA agreement and um, first reading of the <coughs> community choice energy ordinance. Uh, if council, so inclined here in Morro Bay, we would bring bring those items, similar items back on the September 25th meeting. Of course, in between now and, and the 18th and 25th, that there are recommended changes for the ordinance or for the the JPA or any other components of the program. Those can be incorporated um, or at least brought forward to the attention of the City of Slows Council to to understand how that might work for them. So there's still plenty of opportunity to, to ask questions past tonight and to to proceed in a way that makes makes everybody feel comfortable that we're moving in a good direction. So if everything were to proceed according to this timeline, um, everything would be done the first meeting in October and then we begin per, pursuit steadily towards uh, implementation, which would mean the first JPA meetings themselves would occur in October or towards the end of October and November um, we would meet several times to submit the um, implementation document to the PUC ahead of January 1st, 2019. The program development would begin in earnest after that. Um, what that means is uh, doing research. That means doing a significant amount of community outreach uh, because, as, as Chris identified, there are, in the stress cases, there's those, those major factors that we look at that opt out component of that is extremely important. If 20% or 50% of our residents opt out, it's not a viable program. So there's a lot of work that would occur next year to help educate the public about what a Community Choice Energy Program is, to help them understand how they would benefit from that, uh, how their the JPA board would be working in their favor. Um, they would have multiple opportunities to opt out of the program. They're automatically opted in, but they would have a multitude of opportunities to, to opt out. So our job is to explain to them the benefits of the program to ensure that we, we reach that 90% that we were retained as an opt-in uh, position. So that a lot of the work is around truly getting out and educating the public and working with our partners to do that. Um, there's a whole host of other things that would need to occur to be able to go live in 2020, including staffing up. Um, so the, the What's being recommended is that we continue on the path that we're on, that there are alternatives that, um, the first one, not so much, I, that was a cut and paste, but the city of Morro Bay certainly could pursue our own um, CCE program, but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, the city council could direct us to work with existing community choice energy programs like Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, I think their initiation fee is about $250,000. Is that we don't know exactly, but there is a there is a pretty hefty initiation fee to get in, and we would still be in a position where we'd have to wait a year before we could um, participate in the program uh, per the PUC. Um, City Council could request additional information ahead of the 25th, or suggest changes or modifications to the ordinance or JPA agreement, um, or we could sit out and wait until um, you know next year and see you know, how, how the market evolves and if regulations are gonna change. 
Um, I think it's really important to note that you know we did uh, the, the firm working for us did a really solid analysis. Nothing is entirely bulletproof, um, and you know, uh, in our, in my opinion, the benefits do outweigh the cons. But nothing is bulletproof, and uh, we want to make sure that council makes a decision with our eyes wide open and are able to answer, ask all the questions they need to ask, and have them answered sufficiently before you would feel comfortable moving forward. So some of the key questions, at least that we've teed up, that um, certainly there's others that have been asked already, but um, does a technical study and the gender report provide the sufficient information to help inform your decision making? If it is sufficient, do you feel comfortable proceeding forward uh, with the CCE program? And if not, you know, what, what kind of clarifications would you need uh, to submit you know, to staff, but also to the city of slow staff ahead of their September 18th meeting and as well as our September 25th meeting. Um, as it relates to the JPA uh, agreement and resolution, uh, does, that ref does the overall agreement reflect our council's values and priorities? Um, does the proposed governance structure and voting provision support your vision for the program? And does the city council want to identify which council members would be the initial directors? As understanding that you would be put to work as, as early as uh, late October. And there's a whole host of other questions that I, we know we'll have. So uh, hopefully that gives you at least an, uh, an idea of where, where things are at. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of detail to consume uh, and we'll hopefully be able to answer all your questions tonight. Questions? Okay, we'll start off with questions. Matt, you want to start us off? Sure, Scott. Um, in terms of um, looking at when you um, kind of list the calendar um, going forward, um, besides money, what are, in terms of in getting involved in such an endeavor, what are the various risks? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest risk that, that I see is, is the the changing regula regulatory landscape. And when we launched in Santa Cruz, uh, the things that are kind of out there right now weren't weren't there then. Um, but we we did, we know it's it's ever evolving. Um, so that that's kind of the number one risk that I see. Um, and that how that relates back to us is the kind of the upfront loan that we would in essence be partner to uh, with the city of Slow and and the potential risk of upwards of $250,000 or more to the city's general fund because in essence we would hold that money aside in case the thing doesn't actually launch. That's the worst case scenario because once you launch and get going, um, the city's protected from losses uh, once once it's up and running. So that's, that's what I see is that's the biggest risk. Um, I know there's questions about staff time and also council time because you know you will be requested especially in the first year or two as this thing gets started there's a lot of work to do um and, and it's not simple f stuff and so you know you, you would have to consume a lot of information and be be able to, to work um pr pretty hard on that in the first year or two and that's true of staff as well because if the jpa structure as proposed includes city manager or designee participation on the ops board um i Thankfully, do have experience in doing that, um, so it's not foreign territory for me. But I do recall it being a, a fair amount of work, and so that's council's decision. If what do you, we can do anything, but we can't do everything, <laughs> um, is this one of the any things you really want to pursue? Um, we think the payoff is there, but it's it's that against other things that um, we wouldn't be able to, to to move forward on. So that. I don't know if that's a risk so much as a decision point. No, that makes sense. But then given the calendar and looking at that, you're saying that in the next four months you could get this up and running for the, the, year, the 2019 year. Um, how long would it take before the savings or the monetary benefits um, could be realized? Yeah, so the, 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 we would submit to the PUC by January 1st, 2019. The program would be able to launch if everything is put in place correctly. And, and we have a really good team, so I'm fully confident that will occur, we would launch in 2020, okay? Typically, it takes about a year or two to pay down that initial loan. 
Um, by year two or three, you're probably looking at the, um, uh, make sure I can't flip it back. Um, what Chris was talking about, that 68%, you, you know, that's your, your revenues would exceed your costs by that amount, um, probably in, in year three or four, that you would have substantial revenues to invest, either in paying down your rates and or investing in energy programs. So it, usually within a year or two, you've paid off your, your entry loan, and then you're, it's all kind of gravy from there. And so, in essence, then that first year, year and a half would be additional time from uh, Morrow Bay staff and council to get, getting up to speed, and then the JPA group getting up and going. And so, by year two, three, they should be running it. Right. And and it's important to note that their staff, me, we won't be running the program. We, yeah. we will hire. No, I understand. We'll, we'll hire probably contracted staff to do that. You would hire an executive director. They would do the work. They would do the line share, but the operations board would be there to assist in kind of oversight, administration, and operations. And then the policy board is there to make the decisions about budget, about rate rates, and about uh, energy purchasing. So again, the heavy lifting will be done by that contracted staff. But they're, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put, you know rose-colored glasses on, you know, the amount of work that's required since I oh, have seen it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Red? Um, public outreach, I think, is just a real key component of this. And it sounds as if we are being asked to make a commitment at this level before we have much input from the public um, and I I hear you say that that public outreach would take place during 2019 do we have a template program and, or, or experience that tells us that we can be pretty successful I'll, I'll leave that, that up to, to Sean um, you know, at least with, when when we were doing it in Santa Cruz, there was three years of buildup. Um, three years uh, before we launched. Uh, in some respects, we do have that scenario here because we've been talking about this since 2013, when you received council received the the uh, presentation from Slow Clean Energy. Um, I think. The public's understanding of climate change is significantly increased since that time. Uh, I think their sensitivity to cost has increased significantly since that time, sp specifically on Central Coast California. So I think there is there there's a high likelihood that we would be able to meet those that target of a ninety percent that we remained opt-in. But as far as a program for outreach, definitely there are templates to use. Um, whoever we would choose to do that would probably have had experience doing that already. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that we can do that. But yes, I understand that there hasn't been immediate outreach in the recent years, but the public's understanding of these things is, is growing, and uh, I'm pretty confident that we could work with the public to help them understand how it benefits them. But I'll leave it to Sean. Do you want more? Yeah. Okay. Just to add, I want to echo what you're saying, that um, in the draft implementation budget, we do have a substantial budget. I want to say it's you know, around $250,000 for public outreach, and that takes many different forms, including public meetings, um, uh, paid media, earned media, social media, um, can be coffees, city website, city newsletter. We use every um, tool available to us. Um, and then the statute requires that each member of the public receive at least four notifications about the program um, in the lead up, in the 60 days leading up to service commencement, and then 60 days post commencement. So there is um, direct mail notification that occurs as well. And is the, um, the change? 
transparent to the users? Do they notice anything different in any way? Um, well, what they would notice, in addition to receiving the notifications and hopefully word of mouth and other public public information, is that when they get their bill, um, PG&E does continue to provide a consolidated bill. And so on the bill, and I have, I think I have a copy of my home bill with me, it'll say the name of the CCA, so potentially Central Coast Community Energy Electric Generation. That'll show up on page one of your bill with the electric generation charges by CCE, CCCE, and then there will be a credit by PG&E, and then if the customer chooses to do a 100% option and they elect to, to opt up, that would also be on the bill. So it is not, um, for people who don't study their bill every single day, probably you know not immediately recognizable, but it is certainly on page one and several other pages within the electric bill every month. Okay, um, but is there any change in service? No. Just, no. Okay. That's the beautiful part of this is that yeah. the community takes over decision making around what kind of power to procure and put on the grid on behalf of the customers, what kind of rates to offer. Um, but it partners with the incumbent utility, in our case PG&E, to do all of the traditional um, utility functions, including transmission, dis distribution, customer billing. If the power goes out, PG&E takes care of it so that the end-use customer um, hopefully notices that it's greener power and they're hopefully paying a little bit less for that power. Um, but from a daily perspective, it's the biggest change you'll never notice. Okay. Um, and you, you did a stress test assuming some, some worst case scenarios. Um, are there some um, best case scenarios to consider as well? For instance, the closure of Diablo Canyon may cost PG&E a billion dollars, which would be passed on to the ratepayers. Mm -hmm. So if we were in our own CCE, would we be immune from that charge? I don't know about the specific impact of Diablo closure, where the cost allocation to uh, consumers, where that lives. Uh, if that's a charge that's across all the customers, then we'd all experience it equally. If it's can I can I respond to that? So there there was a there are rates uh, when that started up, the the decommissioning that was built into rates from the 80s. So there's not that that's already been that was built into the rates when it first started up. So they they've got the the funds for decommissioning is that is that your point? Yeah, that's that's already that's already been built into the rates since the '80s. Okay, um, a couple of other events that may occur to PG&E would be the cost of wildfire containment that they are responsible for. And so would the, would the CCCE be immunized from that sort of? Thank you, council member. So there are a number of, again, if you're looking at the, the first page of your power bill, right, as, as um, Sean was, was talking about, you'll see a generation line. But you also be, see a transmission and distribution line item. That charge would stay the same regardless of whether you are a member of CCCE or PG&E, and so any costs that are in that bucket, and so in, in, as I understand it, the wildfire, uh, any of the settlements around that would affect the transmission distribution line item, would be felt across all customers. So we're not, not, not immune specifically from that. Okay, and then a third scenario is that PG&E is proposing to black out areas during high fire events such as um, high winds. So PG&E customers would not receive power, say, on a very windy day. Would CCCE continue to receive power during that scenario? 
Well, I think in this scenario really underscores the importance of a close working relationship with PG&E. I think sometimes uh, in, in the media, these CCE programs are portrayed as sort of an opposition to PG&E, but we've seen throughout the state that a really close partnership and relationship is, is key to making this work. And so in those instances where there are public safety issues and where there are grid health issues at stake, that would be uh, you know, a relationship between PG&E and the CCE that would be um, operational for those purposes. As I understand under that condition that you spoke to, I think think on the operational grid health, I think that that's a grid operator decision, but I'd, I'd have to come back with more specific information on that. Okay, thanks. Questions? John Marlos? John? Yes, hey, thanks, Chris. I appreciate the information. Thank you, Scott, for your information. First question is, um, why should Morro Bay reinvent the wheel with a small-scale entity with increased risk as opposed to adjoining a larger entity where that risk could be spread across uh, um, a much greater number of um, entities? Yeah, the, the excellent question. The one that we looked at closely, I mean, council, both councils looked at was the Monterey Bay community power as an option. There is an, there is an upfront cost to, to join, of course. Uh, the main thing is they already have established their voting structure. We would basically be a guest participating in their party. Um, they, they would control how things, they already have a system in terms of how decisions are made around rates, around um, power purchase agreements, as well as how to invest additional revenues. We would the likelihood that they would invest additional revenues into the slow county would be minuscule um, because there's a lot of needs up in Santa Cruz and San Benito County and Monterey County. So that that's the main disadvantage. Um, but the advantages you pointed out are real. They, they have established themselves. They are, they are a viable community choice energy program. So there's no denying that. The other component is that we our will, city council will be discussing shortly the um, Castle Winds offshore wind energy program soon. Um, so the the ability, the future ability to maybe purchase locally sourced, 100% green, clean energy, 30 miles offshore, uh, is pretty enticing, and, and just all all the potential realities of that we, which we haven't conceived of yet are, are there. Um, that would potentially be lost if we were to join forces with somebody outside our region. Thank you, Mr. C City Manager. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. I appreciate that. We, we didn't discuss this prior. Um, um, so if, if this entity, is most, as they all do, takes on the purchasing um, responsibilities, what um, experience with the other entities, CCE entities, have we seen with regard to um, the possibility that PG&E still being the transmission um, provider and the distribution service provider, that they're not going to cost shift in the future and that's going to increase rates for individuals? So we, we have seen that that's correct. Thank you, council member. There has been some um, reallocation of certain fees from generation to transmission distribution lines. I'll just note that those trans, again, those transmission and distribution line item charges are the same across all customers, uh, whether you're in the CCE program or whether you're in the PG&E program. So it really comes down to being able to compete on that generation rate component. And even if uh, we um, are someday not able to uh, provide rate discounts but are only able to compete in the market on price parity. Um, even in a price parity situation, we'd still be generating revenues, having local control of programs, local investments, and then having a seat at the table for negotiations around offshore wind energy, et cetera. Okay. I just want to also add that uh, cost shifting is something that we watch very carefully and ultimately is... Um, would have to be approved through the CPUC. I know. Um, and so, you know, they're the referee on stuff like that, and it's been attempted and in some cases um, refuted uh, because it can be somewhat artificial um, when you cost shift stuff away from generation, put it over in T&D to artificially lower your gen rates to make it hard to compete. The CPUC has been good about not allowing for that. 
Thank you. Thank you. And nonetheless, still a risk, I assume. Yeah. Um, the, the scenario, or your best case scenario, assumes, I think, a 90% capture rate and a 10% opt-out rate. How realistic is it in a year or so to get a 90% capture rate in our community and your community? Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's actually a conservative assumption. We've seen throughout all of the operating programs the rate um, generally under 5% opt-out. So we see about around a 95% participation rate, um, and that's at the low end throughout the state. So hi highly realistic. Okay, great. Um, page 23 of um, your document, and I'm sorry, that's not the staff page sorry. number. I'll give you the staff page number. Um, it's just, you got it? <laughs> yeah. That is um, page 201 um, of our staff report. Um, talks about the sensitivity analysis that you have done um, on this and um, the, the, the biggest risk factor, and I think you mentioned it, that I see, um, and it's, a, it's about to happen any moment, is, is the PCIA mm -hmm. um, decision. And if that um, comes true uh, with regard to the sensitivity analysis that you did, um, this appears to be infeasible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, would you not think that it would be appropriate to wait until that decision was out to make final decisions about this? Thank you, Council Member. This is something we've been uh, concerned about and, and working diligently on. Um, so th your assessment is absolutely correct. And um, I ideally, we wouldn't be put in a situation where we would have a time pressure to make a decision. Now, fortunately, we've been working with our outside counsel as well as our technical vendor to uh, identify what costs would be were we to move forward at our um, uh, public hearings next week at uh, City of San Luis Obispo and the following week here. And uh, our technical vendor has agreed to essentially uh, not any of the costs we've incurred to just defer those and, and essentially continue doing work at risk to not being paid until after the resolution to the PCIA hearing um, based on good faith work and other conversations we'd had prior around their exposure to risk in this process. Uh, secondly, we worked with our outside counsel to identify what costs or risks are in place for uh, adopting the CCE implementing ordinance and adopting the JPA resolution should this decision come back not in our favor. The ordinance would simply be uh, dissolved through uh, another ordinance that dissolves it, uh, and then we would the board of the JPA would would take the act of voting unanimously to dissolve the JPA. Both those actions would essentially unwind those positive actions and could occur this calendar year at no no cost to either agency outside of the minimal staff time it would take to complete that. Okay, great. Yeah, because that, that I mean, you're in your in your analysis, it's a three point two million dollar loss. If that should go up to forty percent, and that's obviously a significant hit for um, the entity. And but you've answered the question. I appreciate that. Page twenty four, your document. Page two hundred two, our document. Um, the risk analysis in terms of risk um, management uh, on uh, section uh, seven. Mm -hmm. Um, speaks to implementing um, an energy risk management program consistent with um, industry best practices. Could you elaborate on that so that I could understand how you're going to spread procurement um, over time um, and do the things that you state there? Just kind of give me an idea what that looks like. Certainly. So, so um, thank you, Council Member. Uh, this underscores the importance of having an industry expert technical partner in being able to uh, actually understand the intricacies of hedging your portfolio in a power market, right? So um, we, can, we can talk a little bit about some of the items here. So spreading procurement over time, just like any investments, that's having um, investments that come to maturity across different time frames, uh, across different counterparties and different technologies. Again, this is a, a diversified portfolio, if you will, if, there's, if, you, if you use the uh, investment portfolio um, as a metaphor. Um, and then continually monitoring those open positions. So um, there's a couple of just things that happen. We, we'll, we'll buy power in advance for the following year or two, but there will be times, there will be days where we haven't bought enough and we're exposed to the market. We need to go buy. Or we bought too much and we're exposed to the market because we need to go sell. So continually 
uh, monitoring our, our energy consumption is in as close to real time as possible and, and sort of having an understanding of what of how our um, forecasted procurement is trending or performing against real real consumption and what that means for our open position is something that the energy authority are experts in and, and that's why we selected them to do that in the, the staffing that you talk about with qualified staff down there a same section mm -hmm. um, have, have you got a sense of um, where you might go given this the fact that this industry is um, 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 it requires the, it, intrinsic knowledge that is extensive in terms of dealing with this kind of commodity. Um, where are you going to look for, for qualified staff, or do you have that internally within San Luis Obispo? Uh, what's the plan for that? Thank you, Council Member. We would do an exhaustive um, search for, for that talent, and we've seen a, the number of existing CCEs. They found highly qualified executive directors or CEOs from the um, power public sector, or sorry, the public power sector, so municipal utilities, executives that are looking for either have retired and are looking to do something else. And we've also seen uh, some, some exodus from the utilities as well as from the regulatory space. So for example, the um, CEO of East Bay Community Energy was uh, working in the legislature and in the Public Utilities Commission as an advanced energy um, you know, advisor. Now I know we're in a rural area, and so that does always introduce uh, additional challenges for, for bringing qualified individuals, but we believe that the, the draw of the program as well as the compensation um, and what our understanding of the talent pool that's available, we feel really uh, comfortable in being able to, to find a good executive director. Okay. Your page 25, um, section 7.1, which is um, uh, well, I guess we, we talked about that. I'll, I'll skip that one. Page um, 26, uh, Appendix A, um, staff page 204. Um, ag again, um, the, uh, can you give me an idea if there is a, uh, a, a, another CC entity that would be the scale size that this entity would be and, and do you have any data on the opt-out rate for those that size or that scale so Solana Beach, which is in uh, mm. San Diego County, has roughly, they're actually a really good comp for Morro Bay, around 10,000 people. Um, and I sent over the other statistics. I don't have the megawatt hours or the customers, but they're, they're pretty close to Morro Bay's. And uh, they began operating this year and so far, far have hit their, their financial metrics. Um, I don't have the specific opt-out rate. And that was Solano? Solana Beach. Beach. Solana okay. Beach. Thank you. Good reference. I'll, I'll look that up and do it. A JPA agreement questions? I don't know who wants to take those, but I do have a few questions there. Page 209. Thanks. Staff report. Um, 2.6.3, um, eminent domain. Have any CCEs actually exerted the eminent domain authority, and what does that look like, and, and why is that in there, and, and what possibly could be the rationale for that? Which exposes me to a lot of risk when I see that. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can remember all of them. The first one is no. No CCA has invoked the eminent domain authority. Uh, the reason that it has was put in there, and we discussed it and determined ultimately to leave it there with a very high threshold to invoke it. So the JPA agreement re would require 75% vote of the board to invoke that. The reason that it's there is if there were ever a case where you wanted to do sort of a large community solar installation or uh, well, probably solar, where you needed to have some kind of an easement across property to um, to run a line, a distribution line, um, to get that power out. That would be the reason that you might need to invoke it. But to date, um, it has not been used. That happened. Could you uh, have eminent domain over um, the Pacific Ocean and uh, wind farm? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I think you have to go to the Bureau of Ocean Management, and I think that actually exists. <laughs> um, uh, 2.6.8, same page. Um, is the city going to be subordinate to the bonds uh, that um, would be issued for the indebtedness? And, and what's the implications, Mr. Pannoni or anybody, uh, with regard to us as a city and liability? Or, or does the entity stand on its own? The entity stands on its own. Okay. Thank you. It's an easy, an easy answer to that. Page 211, and I don't have many more questions, I promise, Mayor. Uh, page 211, uh, same agreement. Um, 
3.3.5, staff page 211, your page 6 of 19. Um, the, the adoption of an annual budget, I assume that means both capital and operational? Yes, sir. Maybe that could be further defined. Um, it's a, a small point, but I think important. 3.3.9 um, speaks to the approval of major capital expenditures, excluding power purchases, as defined by board resolution. Um, do you have an idea what the threshold might be for major? Thank you, Council Member. I, I believe it's articulated uh, uh, prior, but I'd have to. 100K, is that it. what I saw later? I, I believe that's the case. 100,000? Uh, Marshall, do you recall? If I understand you correctly, <laughs> um, the, the CEO um, spending authority is, is different than a major capital expenditure. So the major capital expenditure contemplated for the board of directors as opposed to the operating board, um, there is no dollar amount threshold identified as such, but it would be, you know, on the order of probably multiple hundreds of thousands or millions. So the example here would be if uh, CCCE decided to sponsor a, uh, a solar project or a wind project where you had a capital expenditure to make that happen. So that, that's the, that's, the that's what's that contemplated there. About. Yeah, it's, okay. not, it's not vendor contracts and stuff like that. So, again, would that be further defined by the board at some time? I mean, it may, could be. May, yeah, okay. Sure. Because it's it, pretty nebulous, isn't yes, it? Yes, and it, it certainly can be through policy. So, um, what you don't have here yet, and what you will develop once the board is seated, is a series of right. operational policies, financial policies, and all the rest. Just wondered what the experience was from maybe from some of the other CCEs in terms of the magnitude of that. And it um, has not, you know, at that point, it, it just hasn't really been invoked at this point just yet. Okay. And Councilmember had to remember. The only money that could be spent is what's approved by the budget, and the budget's going to be approved by the board. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 3.4, um, the fourth sentence down, um, be an employee of the CCCE or an employee of one of the parties. Would there be any dual reporting um, conflicts there? I just see that as a potential. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Yes, so under that... that um Arrangement essentially, uh, one of the cities could hire the staff as executive director, right. and then it would be sort of like an enterprise fund um, cost sharing uh, form. Or uh, this actually occurred in the the city of Davis. There, they have staff that is the acting executive director, and 100 percent of his time is uh, uh, paid back to the city. Essentially, as far as the dual reporting requirements, I, I'm not I'm not sure about that. So uh, I assume the authority uh, uh, would be um, board directed for any actions taken by the individual and not circumvented by the other entity that the individual might work with. I was yes, just yes, sir. worried about conflict. Yes, sir. Okay. That's, that's correct. Thanks. Um, page 219 is my last <laughs> <laughs> is my last area um, for thanks. Um, I did read the whole thing, by the way, Scott, and you asked, and I, I did. Uh, page 219, 6.1, uh, uh, well, 6.11, general right to withdraw, a party may withdraw its membership in the CCCE effective as of the beginning of the CCE's fiscal year by giving no less than a six-month advance written notice, um, which notice shall be given to CCC in each party. Withdrawal of a party shall require an affirmative vote of the party's governing board. Um, are there penalties uh, that uh, for withdrawal that will be um, financial penalties that will be um, incurred by an entity that might withdraw? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes. And that is um, contemplated in section... I know. 6.3, continuing financial obligations. Um, and basically what that, what it says in short is that um, essentially that the agency will have incurred um, obligations and expenses on behalf of your community and the customers in your community, uh, including power contracts, hard costs, staffing costs, all of that. So similar to having to pay an exit fee, like we do for the existing utility, um, an arrangement would have to be worked out such that 
your departing load would be responsible for either withdrawing over a period of time so as to reduce financial impact or to pay some kind of an exit fee so that the rest of the customers are not left having to pay for that for your departure. Good, thank you. I just wanted to vet that publicly. I did know 6.3 was there, but yeah. I wanted you to say it and make sure that... And hopefully uh, I said it understandably. Well, I, I, I read it and you, okay. you said it, I think, correctly. So thank you. All right. Thank Thanks. you. No further questions. Marlis? Uh, thank you. Well, you'll be unhappy to know that I have 18 questions, but for, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> uh, many of them have already been addressed and answered, so I will not repeat them, but I may um, ask you to expand on some of them. Um, I, let me start with the issue of the size of um, SCCE and ours I assume would be on the smaller end and we talked about you, you could give one example but I'm assuming that most of them are larger and is there a difference then in both the viability and the outcomes and uh, depending on size. So we, we certainly do see um, benefits to larger programs. You see economies of scale. And you see in the, if you look in the technical study, you see the different uh, participation scenarios. You see there's more cash on hand at the end of year three under the larger participation scenario. And we should note that the financial performers that have the larger participation scenario have those additional cities joining in year two. So we can give a, an example of what we look like as we continue to grow as a program. But, but certainly, as you grow, you um, have the ability to uh, generate more revenues, which means more reserves, et cetera. Um, now, one thing, you can grow too large and lose some of the essential community components, which I think um, you know, some very, very large programs um, some folks may think are lacking. Yeah, and since we're talking about our county, um, I know that in the 4K scenario, you included Paso Robles and um, uh, Grover Beach. Beach. And I believe that's because they showed some interest. What happened to the other cities? Did they all say no, or are they still up for possible? I know the county took action, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not sure about the other cities. Is there a potential to grow to all of the cities in the county? Yes, so the, yes, uh, thank you for the question, council member. The cities that we, we reached out to, so all, all the incorporated cities that gave varying uh, degrees of interest, I would, uh, confirm what Mr. Collins said regarding just being overloaded with um, unfunded pension obligations and cannabis were really the two things that were taking a lot of folks' time. But, uh, but we believe that um, I could give a, a line item accounting of, of whom we think is most likely to join, but, but generally we think the majority of the cities are, uh, have an interest, and especially once we have this uh, foundation in place and are able to show program success, it'll be uh, an, an easy uh, case to make. And I had the same uh, issue and concern about this rulemaking procedure that's coming up and wondering why we couldn't wait until it was over and we had a better sense of what the impact of that is going to be on this. Although, in, I believe in your analysis, that's only one of the negative things that could affect. So is there a kind of a rate that if they passed it, we, it would not be viable? We wouldn't want to move forward? Th thank you, council members. So one of the... so. Obviously, this is a, a major concern of ours as well, and right. one that we've spent a lot of time working with the Energy Authority on understanding sort of different um, potential outcomes, sort of reading the tea leaves of the Public Utilities Commission, which um, is a good or not good use of time, but <laughs> we've been uh, understanding the, the sort of potential range of outcomes. And I would say one of the things that we really have developed an understanding of is that the generation rates risk and the PCIA risk are actually codependent. So if the PCIA ruling is bad, we, we understand, on our current, based on our current understanding, it'll be doubly bad. If the PCIA outcome is good, it will be doubly good. So in some ways, that limits the variables to two. It also underscores the importance of the, the PCIA hearing. The reason that um, our council, as, as I understand it, is, is deciding to move forward, or uh, rather, they haven't decided to move forward yet, but why we're still pursuing it at this point, is just that, that time constraint. So if we miss uh, submitting the implementation plan by the end of this year, then we couldn't launch the program until 2021. And so given that we've identified a number of off-ramps that are no cost to our communities, we, I think we feel comfortable, um, as staff anyway, uh, continuing to present this as an option. Uh, let me pursue that a little bit. Uh, is there any wiggle room in that schedule in terms of like moving the decision dates forward even two weeks? Uh, and still meeting the December 31st deadline. So, 
Um, I'll invite Ms. Marshall up to discuss the specific timing, but I'd also note that there will be a second reading of, of both ordinances. So that could be instead of a normal process where that would be on consent in our city, we might have that as a uh, an actual discussion item, in which case we could discuss the outcomes uh, and then decide to have that second reading or not. So that would essentially move everything back two weeks additionally. Um, and if you have additional requests for information, we can have Ms. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you, you don't know for sure when this rulemaking uh, proceeding is going to take place, either two days from now or two weeks. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, and with 99% certainty, it's now the 27th of December. Oh. Uh, excuse me, of September. <laughs> okay, so probably another two yep. weeks. And that's why we've worked internally on some of these mitigation strategies and TEA has agreed to go ahead and move forward and extend its phase one, assuming of all the risk until that determination has been made. The reason that um, we have the timeline set forth as we do is that we have to seat the JPA board. Um, that JPA board then needs to um, review the implementation plan. Usually there's a draft implementation plan and then there's a second meeting that's a public hearing where that implementation plan is adopted and then it has to go to the CPUC for certification by the end of the year. So what happens is the longer we delay sort of the the final decision making and then we've got to schedule the meetings, it's just it's a function of just logistics and, and timing. So you would not be working on an implementation plan until you know you're moving forward. Correct. Right. And that requires a go no go decision to move forward from both councils in this case. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's a question about the rates and who sets them. Um, my understanding here is that the JPA board will set rates. Is that correct? Yes, So Member. is there's no 218 process necessary for that, having just gone through that here this evening? No, the electricity rates are not subject to 218. And has that, it's, it's not ever been an issue? No, no, ma'am. The reason being is that you can opt out, you know, you don't have an opportunity to opt out as a water or sewer customer. In this case, you would have the opportunity to opt out. Okay. So that that's how that's why Prop 218 isn't invoked for these programs. All right. Um, and uh, you mentioned a budget, and I know we're talking about raising a million dollars, presumably. You have a detailed budget for that million dollars. Uh, what you're going to need to get started? We have a draft uh, interim line item budget to get us to that uh, million and actually it's a we have in our pro forma 1.1 million uh, just to have some contingency there and that's the item we do pay off in so the first we could years, ask to see that and yes yes council member okay um and i'm curious to ask our our city attorney his assessment of the jpa agreement and if he thinks it's reasonable and fair having reviewed it and um I guess part of it is if you start out with a four-member board, I understand you're trying to look for unanimity, but do you run into issues when councils change? And uh, I'm just wondering what the experience with that is. So I'll defer to city attorney for the first question. <clears throat> yeah, the first question. The first question. If the council is comfortable with the policy decisions that are necessary for that agreement, this agreement is, I don't see a problem with the agreement. Okay. Then. Sure, yeah. So council member, I, I would just note, I'll, I'll actually bring Sean back up to discuss um, some of, of her experience with I, these I'm structures throughout the state. I'm just curious, given that, that the board is com composed mm -hmm. of elected officials and they change, and I'm just wondering how that has had an impact on governance? Great question. So just so you know, um, Valley Clean Energy Alliance is a program up in Yolo County, um, similarly structured in that they're small. They have now three communities uh, that have joined and each community has two board member representations, representation meaning it's not an odd number. Um, we borrowed a, a number of the voting procedures from them. Um, when there has been council turnover, and that hasn't yet happened in Valley because they just launched this past June. But with other CCAs, when there has been council turnover, um, essentially the JPA agreement, I believe, says that within 45 days, the council will um, appoint 
another one of their elected representatives to take the place of the person who was leaving. It's happened a few times and it has not been an issue. Uh, so there's never a, a, enough of a turnover to suggest mm. we no longer want to be a part of this. I've not seen that. Okay. No. Okay. Um, and then if I could also ask uh, Ms. Calloway um, her assessment of the financial risks <coughs> moving forward, given our current financial condition. Um, the initial, I think, $50,000 that we um, were proposing to use, we have um, some savings in the current year budget um, from the Animal Services Agreement and the um, fee study, so I think we'd set that aside um, in a reserve fund um, to have that available should we need it. And then the, um, the additional money at this point would have to come from general fund reserves should we need to um, dip into that for, for that. And there is sufficient money in there to do that. Um, it, depending on the year it happened, could take us below the 27.5% level. And we report that out. Um, alternatively, when we close the year, if there's um, excess revenues available, we could set some additional money into that reserve fund for the program. And do you have an opinion about just the, 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 the risks associated with moving at this point in time with the uncertainty and the size and the other issues we've raised? Um, <laughs> Maybe you don't want to answer that. No, I, I'm, I, they were going through this um, in Los Gatos when I was there and it moved at a similar pace, so it, it, I don't really have any noted concerns. Okay, and if I could just ask a, a question also about the weighted voting, because there's a statement in here that under most conditions, it's just each person gets an equal vote on the board, but there are conditions when a weighted voting would occur. And if you could just describe how often that might happen, or what the, what what would trigger it, or uh, because then obviously, if you're the small end of the, <laughs> I mean, we would never have a vote. <laughs> So if you could just explain the weighted voting procedures. Thank you, council members. So this is an, a, an additional conservative measure to ensure sort of prudent decision making. And in fact, the weighted vote, should that be called by members from different, by uh, board, by directors from different members, that weighted vote would have to occur in addition to a majority of the board voting. So it's not in place of or in lieu of. Um, we actually, there are, very limited circumstances. I think we've seen it tried once in the state, um, and it was for a specific membership measure, if I recall, and it, it didn't pass. They're, they couldn't raise the dual voting standard, so. Okay, uh, but when you have only a four-member board, it seems <laughs> possible that you would have <laughs> disagreements, but. Th thank you, council member. And, and, and without a majority possible, possibly. In a four-person four, four board under the provisions in the agreement, um, the weighted vote essentially could not be called. It's a okay. moot point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the, the report. Um, I have some questions for Sean. Sean, I didn't get your last name, so I'm just calling you Sean, so forgive me of the, of the lack of formality. Huh. Marshall? Okay, Miss Marshall. <clears throat> So thank you. So uh, you have experience as a mayor, so an elected official on the board as well. And so I'm. It, this is just kind of general conversations. I'd like to understand, let me frame it. Considering this council, as probably your council, serves on an ICMA board, a slow cog board, um, a, air quality board um, and then our liaisons there are a number of boards that we serve on this board in particular in my view will demand um, a lot of work and a lot of attention so having been through that explain to to us in, in as best you can kind of your experience from that and and i'll just let you go from there okay great um, it was a lot of work, and I served as a council liaison before I was mayor on the task force that ultimately became MCE, and then I served as the founding vice chair of the agency when we launched. Um, I will say that that is part of the reason why you have a board structure that's proposed here. 
that basically says the board of directors comprised of elected representatives um, shall meet for a certain, you know, for the big ticket items and for general policy direction. Uh, but that only has to be a couple, three times a year. Whereas your operations board, made up of your um, city executives, they're meeting on a monthly basis. And so that was a way for us to sort of mitigate the very real impact on time and attention that would have to be paid um, in your participation, because it is a lot of work. And it's, I will tell you that by my experience and what I've seen now with others, the first year is where the rubber meets the road, because you're doing all of the startup, you're getting your policies in place. The good news is now that a lot of this has been developed, so you're not having to do stuff out of whole cloth, perhaps the way that you know was done, gosh, almost 10 years ago now. So um, it's a legitimate question, but we've done our best to sort of mitigate the impact for you guys. Thanks. And what about uh, technical teams? Uh, so there was a suggestion that we could we could uh, appoint technical teams, and I'll use SlowCog as an example. So our Council of Governments has you know Citizens uh, Technical Advisory Committee, and there's a lot of benefit for that because mm -hmm. you, um, you can appoint, as you may be aware, we have some pretty talented people, um, and they can provide a lot of continuity when you have elected officials that term out right. or come and go. Uh -huh. Any so experience some, there? Yeah, some CCAs have community advisory committees, some do not. Um, it really just depends on the disposition of the board and the community and how engaged the community is and wants to be. Um, we've seen it work really well when the community advisory committee has a specific scope and charge and understands that they're advisory as opposed to, in this case, a third board of directors, because yeah. nobody wants to manage that. And that, that's your downside of just having more to manage. Yeah. Um, but when they work well, um, that has definitely been a net positive, and you can have um, a lot more um, sort of voices at the table who have experience to bear. OK. Um. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Anything else? No, that's good for okay. right now. Thank you. And then, Chris, on page um, 177 of our staff report, it lays out the schedule. And so for 918-18, uh, there's a technical study session for the city of San Luis Obispo. Um, is that going to be in council chambers? Yes. And on, on September, thank you, Mayor, on September 18th, that will actually be the public hearing. Um, and that will be at City Council Chambers. Um, what time is that? Uh, Six o'clock regular 6 start. Okay. And then, um, so, and then on 10 2, um, you know, I guess maybe I just asked that maybe you can send some of the more specific, the time and locations of your meetings. I think it might be beneficial if, you know, we have time or if I have time to, to attend those. So on the schedule here, the list of the San Luis Obispo uh, City Council meetings or study sessions that you may be having if we have the opportunity to attend and just watch those. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, right. I'll share the specific okay. details with okay. Mr. Collins. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then... <clears throat> I have more comments on the JPA itself, so I'll reserve you know any any follow up questions for later at this point, and then perhaps get in discussion. And for right now, um, I'll conclude the questions for staff. Unless there's any follow, -up. we could do follow up questions later, and I'll open up for public comment. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, first up. Uh, Barry Rands, and I know he was here earlier, and I and we did receive his email from that. I'm sorry he wasn't able to um, speak uh, on our general public comment, so sorry about that, Barry. Um, next up would be Eric Beam. Welcome, Eric. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council, Eric Beam, City of San Luis Obispo. Uh, I'm very excited to... Uh, be here and to, to have you so actively engaged uh, in this conversation. Uh, you've been asking fantastic questions. I'm chair of the Slow Climate Coalition Task Force, which in essence we have an MOU with the city of Slow and have been acting um, as a community resource providing technical and community support in advancing this. And so um, I think the work that we're doing could be a model uh, to adapt to the community choice program as a technical advisory committee or a community advisory committee. Um, I, um, 
you know, I just want to express how excited I am at the possibility of our partnership. Um, we will create a program that will be transformative for our county, and it will start here. Between San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay, we sh have shared uh, interests and values, and uh, being able to express those values in our partnership agreement, I think is, is really, uh, will set the context for how this expands into the broader region, and it will expand and we'll, we'll be active in doing so. I did want to express to you that our uh, task force has been active in outreach in Morro Bay as, to the best of our ability, and will continue to do so um, as much as possible uh, and in support of, of your leadership. Um, and the awareness of the community. Um, and then lastly, I want to say that I'm, I'm excited about the possibility of offshore floating wind. I'm sure you've seen in the news how it's, it's broken free and there's, there's momentum to build again. Um, Redwood Coast Energy Authority, which is a community choice program in, uh, on the Redwood Coast in Humboldt, is active uh, with a coalition developing a 125 megawatt offshore floating wind project. I was in communication with them, the executive director, on uh, this last Thursday, and I see the p possibility, even before we, we launch the program, to initiate a coalition uh, to, uh, as, a, as a community choice program to, to uh, start uh, accelerating the development of offshore floating wind in in Morro Bay and, and in our region. So, just so many. Uh, we are at a, a, a turning point where technology is converging and is transforming energy and transportation. And our, we, our this community choice program will will be an economic engine driving that transformation for to for to the benefit of all of all of our residents and uh our our climate so thank you so much for your leadership and i look forward to to seeing you again thank you thanks eric with that i don't have any more speakers left is there anybody like to speak to this item done okay thanks um I will uh, bring it back to council for discussion. Um, I know I have some comments and, and perhaps some conversations, uh, Chris, with San Luis Obispo on things that um, I, I'd like to discuss with council with the, the JPA and, um, and specific language and just uh, whether or not um, uh, what the city feels, um, the city of Moore Bay feels uh, the JPA and basically the purpose and the mission that we're going to is is that's um, that's pretty important. So on page 206 of 245 is is the the opening of what is the purpose of uh, this JPA and um, we need to be in 100% um, agreement of that. So um, I can start off with some of my comments on that, or I can just turn it over to to whoever wants to start on this. Okay, um, uh, page 206 on C it says that the purpose for entering into this agreement include and it's A, B, C, D, and E and though you know I, I agree with all of them I there's there's I've just made some edits as I see it um, for discussion with council on what that would be as an example um, item C it says carry out programs to reduce energy consumption and in some of the other texts what it references is efficiency programs. I would, I, I don't view the the goal is to reduce energy consumption by by that means, but provide and promote energy efficiencies. And um, there might be some conversations to have under that, but um, that's what I you know thought from a language standpoint and what we would what would be our purpose should should be discussed. And if you go down into some of the um, item E, it'll, it, it actually reads the same way where uh, the first sentence that it says, the intent of this agreement to promote the development and use of a wide range of renewable energy sources and energy efficient programs. Um, so that, that I just want to pose for a discussion item for council. And if we were to um, have any more discussions on that, we'd have to go to page 208 in the document as well. And it, it says reduce um, customer energy use. And I, there again, I would say that should be promote energy efficiencies. Um, and, and then, um, and I'm just going to get to one other item here. And I'll find it here in a minute. Where was it? 613. 
on 613, which is uh, page 219 of 245. This is the, the right to withdraw prior to program launch. And then midway down in the paragraph, it says those conditions include, and that's item number one, the CCCE is unable to provide total electrical rates that are equal to or less than the incumbent utility at time of program launch. For discussion, my feeling is that if th we should be able to be at less the incumbent utility rates, if we're at or equal to, we're not meeting the goal. And um, it should be an opt out at, at that point. I, I think it's, it may be somewhat incidental to some, but it, it, I think it's worth the discussion to, to determine we should be able to meet that threshold going in. So my, my point in this, Chris, I'm sure we might have some dialogue here once council gets into that, because this is something the city of San Luis Obispo has really already agreed to at this point, and this is at least kind of the process we have to go to go through. But it's it, it reads that the CCC is unable to provide total electric rates that are equal to or less than the incumbent utility at time of program launch. My feeling is that we're, if we're not meeting it, if, if it's equal to, then we're we're not going to be meeting the mission in which we should be entering into. And so I, I would think that if we're not, if it's not less than, we should have the opt out to say we're not there. And and that's my feeling as far from the city of Moore Bay. And that, that's those are my two key points in, in this document that I'd like to have discussion with council. And then appropriately, uh, Chris, you might be able to respond to those types of things too, because especially up front, we're, we're, we're really talking about the purpose of the JPA. And, um, you know, it's a language thing, um, but we, we definitely need to have that agreement on where we stand. And so those, those, are, those are the two big items for me on the JPA as I've been um, wanted to present to, to um, the council for discussion. And unless there's others that we want to just lay out and roll into discussion, I'm, I'm open for that. But um, that was all I had for the JPA. And was there any you want to start out with discussion on that or are there any more um, discussion items for the JPA that we would want to bring up for discussion at this point a anybody Matt well as I'm reading um, your item that you just brought up on page 219 613 given the rationale for um, this JPA and given the rationale of what it means to go forward with this um, I understand your point in terms of um, if the rates were um, greater than, but if they're equal to or less, given the rationale of going into this uh, on this um, JPA, I would think uh, I can see going into the GP JPA and if we got the equal to or less, simply because the equal to, I understand your point, like why would we do that if we can get those same rates from the other one? However, given the rationale of doing the JP in the first place, equal to wouldn't be the best re um, um, result, but however, it would be better than what we were doing before. Um, so I, I, I see your point, but I, I disagree with it. Okay. Any, um, Brandon, any discussion on that? Yeah, to me, the the rate is not the only reason for for entering into this program. So if it's equal to, I'm okay with with that. Okay. Anybody yeah. else, John? Yeah, my comment is purpose on two point four um, really outlines uh, the fact that you know we're moving towards um, a greater re renewable energy portfolio and uh, reducing uh, greenhouse energy emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And if we can do that with equal rates. Um, uh, that's, in my mind, a good thing. Um, but the consumer will make the decision um, on whether to opt in or opt out based upon that. So I'm, I'm not so sure I see that as an issue. But no, and, and, and I agree with that logic, uh, that there are other reasons why we would be doing this that are balanced by rates. And you're right. If this consumer doesn't like it, they can opt out. So... Uh, but we're trying to move toward renewable energy, and that may be more expensive at some point. So it is the mix that we're concerned about. 
And, and, I, and that's a good point. As we talk about moving towards renewable uh, energy, that's that's being established from the state legislation. Right. And and the market will will set a lot of that. Um, I, I think we just had a pretty discu big discussion tonight about rates for our water and waste wastewater. Um, the fundamental goal here is that we can achieve a greater savings as a CCE. And that's, more local that's, control. That's what, that's what the, the, the mission was. Um, in addition to the greenhouse gas and, and uh, renewable energy, uh, and, and, and clearly, if there's the opt out for people that want cheaper energy, they're going to they're going to be able to opt out. But I don't want to necessarily set the parameters that renewable energy at any cost. That's my point. Thus, thusly, the point um, equal to not greater than, equal to, or less than, is, is what I read. Yeah, and, so. and to me it was just like, if we're getting into this, let's set the threshold right out of the gate. And, and it's, it's a moot point from, from the standpoint of, just from discussion, and, and I'm willing to move on if there's not the willingness to, to, to move on that. And then the, the other one then is um, item, uh, so the, the very first one on uh, C, and that would be carrying out programs to promote energy efficiencies versus reduce energy consumption. And we're on page 206. Chris, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, so I think the, the idea here was that if we had an energy efficiency or an energy conservation program, this would, would capture both of those. But in some ways, I, I think it's a uh, nuance that's um, not critical. So if, the, if this council prefers energy efficiency, we could, we could consider that edit. Yeah. yeah, I like that. I like it better. Any, any more comments? Energy efficiencies would be acceptable. Okay. Uh, those are the two items that I just wanted to be able to discuss. So at this point, um, Mr. Have, Mayor, just for clarity, add the word efficiencies where consumption is, but then you don't want to have a reduce. You want to have a create. Increase. Yeah. So to increase promote, energy. to promote oh, energy um, energy efficiencies yeah. and reduce energy con and delete energy consumption. And then, of course, that would mean on page 208, um, 2.4, uh, reduce customer energy use. It, it, it just replace that with um, promote energy of, um, energy efficiencies in that, in that sentence as well. Any other any other uh, items of discussion beyond the, the 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 JPA agreement that folks have talking points on or concerns? Red, Matt, John, Marlos. Are we just we're at summary now, or we're, we're yeah. at discussion? Yeah. So so my concerns would be um, obviously um, limited staff time, um, and I, I'm gonna uh, have to defer to Mr. Collins, um, who's made his presentation and. Um, indicated that this is something that um, will fit into uh, the schedule and that is manageable without um, um, decreasing his utility and his staff's utility to the community. Um, and so I, I, I trust that, but it, it still remains um, a concern in a small entity such as this. Uh, I struggle with scale. Um, I set it up front. Um, however, um, I think from an environmental justice standpoint, it's the right thing to do. And I think a key comment was made earlier about um, the potential for future offshore wind energy. And the synergies with an organization like this could benefit Morro Bay greatly. Um, and I know that's a ways down the line, um, but in my opinion, 
That's what we're supposed to be doing, <laughs> looking down the line, far out at the 30,000 foot uh, level, and, and that's where I tend to operate. So, um, uh, additionally, um, I, I really have no issues with the JPA agreement. It, it's, it feels like it, it looks very fair to me. My, my questions were answered. Um, I appreciate that. It appears to me that the financial risk is minimum. Um, for Morro Bay at this time. My greatest fear is the upcoming PCIA decision. And um, if I'm assured that we have an out without spending any money, if that is a no-go um, action that creates an insolvent entity, then I have a level of comfort um, in um, moving forward with the consideration of this as um, uh, something that we, we would be involved in. The, uh, the other thing that uh, a couple of community members raised is, quote unquote, let the community decide. And um, in my opinion, this does let the community decide because they get to opt in or opt out. So, I mean, they have a choice and it, it doesn't require a community vote. They either have the choice to opt in or opt out. And hopefully with good marketing, um, um, there will be good rationale for people opting in and the achieving the achievement of not only the efficiencies that were described by the mayor and the renewable portfolio, but also rate savings, which would be um, important to both communities that, as we know, um, are becoming very high cost, not becoming, are very high cost of living um, um, areas along the coast of California, and we're looking for any potential cost reductions for our citizens as we possibly can, so that becomes a key uh, point for me. Thanks. Mr. Mayor? The time. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we need a motion to uh, continue um, beyond 11 o'clock, and um, I guess we could do it just to complete this item and then maybe continue um, item C2. Um, and so I need a motion to continue past 11 o'clock. So move to, to complete this item only. Second. We have a motion um, by Mr. Heading, second by Ms. McPherson. Uh, any further discussion? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries 5 0. Okay. It hurts us all. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fred. So we well, can go ahead and uh, finish yeah. this item. Go ahead, Marlos. Okay, Marlis. thank you. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I fully support this concept. I support the idea mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. am in favor of it. I, my concerns, I have the same concerns that John raised, in addition to the one of that we seem to be moving just too quickly. Um, I wish that I'd had more time to study this and to reach out to some of the other communities and talk to them about it and really get a sense for where they're at because I feel it's too small and I think we need to really work hard to get the other communities involved. Um, and I was very concerned about the rule making process coming up and what that could do to it and why not wait. But as long as I were assured that we're not going to uh, lose money if it turns out badly for us, I am willing to proceed also with some reluctance. <laughs> I wish I would, we could do it a year from now and give us more time to involve more people. Thank you. Matt? I'm in support of this item. Okay, thanks, Red. I don't mind being a leader in the county to uh, move forward with this project. Good job, thanks. Uh, I'll just uh, echo my um, support for the item and my concerns as well for staff time going through that. Um, uh, Scott and I had that same conversation. Um, uh, it, San Luis Obispo is, is, um, has the benefit of, of Chris as a full-time person, staff person for that to assist in the load. And, and that's something um, as this moves forward and there are um, revenues that can um, help support a staff person in that role, um, that might be something that we have the option to do um, if, if the need desires. But it, it will definitely take us operating on all cylinders to make, make sure we're doing that. And, um, 
and the city is a, a primary focus as well. So we need to be able to balance all that. So with that, um, we take a mo motion to move uh, forward on this with the um, adjusted. Uh, basically, this is this is um, not necessarily a motion to move forward on anything on this. We're just taking the information. Uh, Chris will be taking the the, the the summary of the changes back to council. Uh, um, City of San Luis Obispo Council and and your staff to kind of refine um, and approve the the changes as as discussed. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I just wanted to offer my thanks again to San Luis Obispo, um, Mayor Harmon, and uh, the City Council for the resources provided to us. Um, very beneficial. We appreciate that greatly. I don't want to overlook that each time and mentioning that, uh, Chris. Thank you for your uh, yeah. work and. And um, uh, Bob, we didn't hear, hear from you, but glad to have you here. And, and Sean, thank you for your expertise in this and, and your past experience. And staff, thank you for all the time amidst all the other things that are going on for, for presenting this and bringing this to us. All right. Brad? Scott, have we given you everything you wanted? It is Christmas. <laughs> I, I I think we have plenty of direction for, to proceed forward and come back on the September 25th. So thank you. Okay, good. All right. With that, then we'll conclude um, item C1. And uh, as discussed, when we made a motion to continue past 11 o'clock, uh, making a motion to continue item C2, Joe. Um, uh, to a date certain or a date uncertain? It doesn't need to be a date certain. Okay, so we but we just do we do make need to make a motion that we'll continue mm -hmm. item C two or just bring it's it just, back at a later date. Right. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we move that we bring item C two, which is uh, update the Harbor Department lease management policy, back at a later date to be determined. Second. Second. So motion by Mayor Iron, second by Mr. Davis. And um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries 5-0. And with that, future gen items, any? None. Um, so our next city regular city council meeting is Tuesday, September 25th, 2018 at 6 p.m. right here at um, Veterans Memorial Hall. And before we conclude, just want to thank staff for all their work um, getting us through tonight, um, our public hearing for the Prop 218 and, and all the work um, that you all do. So thanks very much. And if, if the, I, let's, go ahead, Fred. This was an historic night, and I'm proud to be here. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Glad you're here with us. All right, okay. Unless there are any 